um mit allen Parteien zu konsultieren, um einen Konsens zu erzielen und Brücken zu bauen im Rahmen des äh, Rahmenübereinkommens der Vereinten Nationen zur Klimaveränderung. Tschech ist nicht mehr in ferner Zukunft. Das wird ein wichtiger Wendepunkt auf der internationalen Bühne darstellen. Mit noch nie dagewesenen geopolitischen Spannungen, mit den Auswirkungen auf die Ernährungssicherheit und die Zuverlässigkeit der internationalen Lieferketten. Seitig Zeiten, wo es noch nie so wichtig war, global gegen den Klimawandel vorzugehen. Das kritische Jahrzehnt zum Handeln hat begonnen. Und die wissenschaftlichen Erkenntnisse sprechen eine deutliche Sprache. Wenn wir jetzt nicht mehr zum Klimaschutz tun, global, aber gemeinsam unsere Verpflichtungen und Zusagen erfüllen, unsere Zusagen und Klimaziele erhöhen und unsere Anpassungsfähigkeiten an den Klimawandel verbessern, wird das 1,5 Grad Ziel des Pariser Übereinkommens nicht erreichbar sein. Ich entschuldige mich dafür, dass ich heute etwas heiser klinge. Deshalb ist es nun unsere Aufgabe, in diesen unsicheren Zeiten rasch zu handeln und sicherzustellen, dass der Klimaschutz weiterhin ganz, ganz oben auf der internationalen Tagesordnung bleibt. Die gegenwärtige Situation in der Welt darf nicht als Ausrede verwendet werden, um frühere Zusagen nicht mehr einzuhalten, vor allem was die Unterstützung der Entwicklungsländer anbetrifft. Als nächste Präsidentschaft der COP27 ähm, haben wir die Aufgabe, Meinungen zusammenzubringen, allen Akteuren Raum zu geben, damit sie ihre Prioritäten und ihre Klimaziele darlegen können und ihre Besorgnis Ausdruck geben können. Das schaffen wir nur durch einen partizipativen Ansatz, in dem sich alle wohlfühlen, an dem Ort, an dem sie in dieser globalen Anstrengung aktiv sind. Und ich brauche dazu Ihre Hilfe, ich brauche dazu Ihre Unterstützung. Vor einem Monat habe ich äh, mich kurz an den gegenwärtigen Verhandlungen äh, bei, in Bonn beteiligt. Und ich habe dort sehr viel, viel Ermutigendes aus den verschiedenen Regionalgruppen gehört. Und ich habe gehört und ich habe viel mehr von den Kalimaten und den Gehörten und den Gehörten in vielen der Regionalgruppen die politische Entschlossenheit erfüllt, die ich von Ihnen als Ministerin und Ministerin anderseits höre, bei allen die ich in den vergangenen Monaten und Wochen hatte. Das stimmt nicht überein mit dem, was die Menschen überall in der Welt sagen, die vertreten werden durch die Zivilgesellschaft, mit denen auch ich eine sehr fruchtbare Diskussion hatte. Und das Bild, das wir sehen, ist klar. Es bleibt noch viel zu tun in den nächsten wenigen Monaten, um die Lücken, die Kluft zu überwinden. من أجل سد الفجوات المتصلة بهذه القضية ومن ثم فإننا علينا جميعا أن نظافر الجهود من حل هذه الأجهالة القضية جميع الشركاء علينا أن نتعاونوا لأنها قضية ولا سيما وأن هذا الموضوع سوف يطرح على Fatah Sisi and German Chancellor Olaf Scholz and I hope that in the discussions of today استعدادا لقمة المناخ كوب 27. The Petersburg Climate Conference is a preparation for the UN Climate Change Conference COP 27, and I really thank my German counterpart and Alina Berbot to make this dialogue a story of success. This was this has a very positive impact to make this a story of success. I thank you very much. Vielen Dank, Sami, dafür, dass du diesen Petersberger Klimadialog mit mir leitest. Ich danke dir für den Abschluss. Thank you very much for making the summit of today a success. Ich danke you all for the efforts exerted in this conference to make it a successful one. استعدادا لقمة شرم الشيخ سامي الشيخ سامي الشيخ 
Und ich glaube, wir werden in eine Diskussion beginnen, in eine Diskussion einsteigen, wo jeder seine Punkte auf den Tisch legen darf, damit dann auch Kopf und Zwanzig zu einem Erfolg führen. Wir werden die wichtigen Punkte, die heute während der Aktivitäten der COP27 diskutiert werden, nicht nur Vorträge vorlesen, sondern tatsächlich die Herausforderungen angehen. It's not only it's not only speeches or words, but to reach a comprehensive solutions and recommendations to be implemented on the ground by the whole world. In this context, we will discuss the things and the expectations. I thank you all for your attention and for attending and for cooperating for your cooperation. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I extend my thanks to the German Foreign Minister and to the Egyptian Foreign Minister. And I'd like to express my happiness and pride to attend this gathering. I also would like to express my feeling to participate with um, my speech. In this gathering, and to be among all those uh, friends and partners in this work, to be involved into uh, open uh, discussions in this field. Egypt opens up to the world. President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi meets with world leaders. وعبر لكم عن خالص الشكر والتقدير على حفاوة الاستقبال وكرم الضيافة. Reaffirming Egypt's vision, delivering our voice abroad. لتطوير التعاون الثنائي الاقتصادي والعسكري إلى مستويات غير مسبوقة. Discussing regional and international developments. Solid and strong relations on the path of partnership and development. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. 9 a.m. Cairo local time. This is a quick look at our list of stories. President Abdel Fattah Sisi began a visit to the German capital, Berlin. The visit came upon the invitation of the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz to participate in the Petersburg Climate Dialogue under the joint chairmanship of Egypt and Germany. Presidential spokesperson Ambassador Bassam Radi said the Petersburg Climate Dialogue is one of the important stations ahead of the next round of the Global Climate Summit in Sharm el Sheikh in November as it represents an opportunity to, uh, for consultations and coordination among a large group of the active countries that confront climate changes. Radi added that Egypt's joint chairmanship in the summit comes due to its viral, vital role under the leadership of President STC within the framework of the climate change negotiations over the previous years.
President Abdel Fattah Sisi received Peter Larson, the CEO and the owner of the Larson for Maritime Industries in Berlin. The meeting was attended by Rear Admiral Ahmed Khalid, commander of the Strategic Command and supervisor of the military industry, as well as Egypt's ambassador to Germany, Khalid Galel. Presidential spokesperson Ambassador Radi said the meeting tackled cooperation between Egypt and the German company, which has deep expertise in the fields of maritime industries and arsenals, in addition to training programs for technical workers to help uh, uh, to raise their capabilities of uh, the Egyptian cadres to cope with the international standards. For his part, Larson expressed satisfaction for the path of the bilateral cooperation with Egypt, as well as the numerous existing direct investment opportunities in the country, particularly after the comprehensive development Egypt has carried out in the infrastructure sector during the past few years. Foreign Minister Sam Shukri addressed the opening session of the Petersburg Climate Dialogue in the German capital Berlin. And uh, the, um, uh, the opening session was co-chaired by Egypt top diplomat Sameh Shukri and his German counterpart Annalena Baerbock. Earlier on the sidelines of the dialogue, Egypt's top diplomat met with interim executive secretary of UN Climate Change Convention, Ibrahim Teo. Foreign Ministry spokesperson, Councillor Ahmed Halfad, said Shukri congratulated the UN official on assuming his task and expressed aspiration for continuing coordination and consultation over the upcoming COP27, which will be hosted by the Ritzy Resort of Egypt of Sharm el Sheikh later this year in November. Prime Minister Dr. Mustafa Malbouli chaired a meeting to follow up on the preparations by, uh, taken by Egypt to host the UN COP27. The meeting was attended by Environment Minister Yasmin Fouad and the Ambassador General Coordinator of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for Organization and Financial Aspects of COP27, Ashraf Ibrahim. Cabinet spokesperson Ambassador Nader Saad said Madbouli asserted the political leadership's keenness to render the summit successful to showcase Egypt's regional and international position. For her part, Fouad reviewed the most important steps which have been taken to prepare for the summit in the areas of logistics, com accommodation, transportation, communication, health, visa and registration. That's all we have for now. Stay tuned on Nile TV International. Also, for more updates and for more details, please log on to www.nileinternational.net. Many thanks for watching. In a gulf-fed lagoon, injured sea turtles swim through the final stages of their rehabilitation journey before their release into the sea at Dubai's Turtle Rehabilitation Sanctuary. The injured species cured Four by the Rehabilitation Center are among thousands of others found on the shores of Dubai. The Dubai Turtle Rehabilitation Project has saved over 2,000 turtles in nearly 20 years of its existence. It is an extremely important project as it is the only project of its kind in the region. Sea turtles face day-to-day -day threats as they make their migratory journeys across the world's oceans. Some of those risks are caused by the environment and others by humans, such as entanglement, plastic ingestion or boat strikes.
washed up on the shore, the turtles are rescued by the rehabilitation center and placed in an aquarium facility where they receive medical care as part of the first phase of the treatment. In their tailor-made lagoon, they sway the turtles by feeding them vegetables. They then dive into the water and catch the sea creatures to have their shells cleaned as they prepare them for the release. But it's not a goodbye for all turtles after their release, as several of them are fitted with satellite transmitters that allow the rescue center to track their journey. All seven species of sea turtles are listed as vulnerable to extinction, endangered or critically endangered. The hoax-bill turtle native to the Middle East is listed as critically endangered with an, only an estimate 8,000 nesting females left worldwide. التابعة. نحن نعرف أن هناك مجموعة من الموضوعات الحاسمة التي لم يتم التعامل معها بشكل كاف وهي موضوعات مرتبطة بجدول الأعمال التي لم يتم التأكيد عليها بشكل مناسب مثل الخسارة والأضرار هذه مسألة مهمة للغاية والدول غادرت قمة جلاسكو بشعور بالإحباط بأنه لم يتم القيام بما يكفي في هذا الإطار لتقديم التعويض عن الخسائر والأضرار ونحن نجد أن المكون المالي للأضرار يجب أن يتم التعامل معها بطريقة مجبولة من قبل الجميع ومن المهم كذلك أن نقاشاتنا بما أنها قد بدأت فيجب مرة أخرى أن تؤكد القبول العام لكل الأطراف للتعامل مع هذه المسألة ونتمنى أنه في برلين نتمكن كذلك من التعامل مع هذا الموضوع الهام بطريقة يمكن أن تعطينا مسارا باتجاه 
إجراءات مؤثرة وأكثر إنتاجية للتعامل مع هذا الأمر خاصة في إطار مؤتمر الأطراف 27 فيما يتعلق بالتخفيف من أثار تغير المناخ فإننا نسعى Uh, achieve uh, positive results um, uh, during uh, this conference also to put uh, uh, a long-run strategy or strategies to be accurate uh, uh, coinciding with the uh, Paris uh, Convention uh, also uh, regarding the bond deal we should be uh, that committed uh, to uh, all these recommendations of the past conferences in the, the COP27 of Sharm el Sheikh also we will uh, we agree as ministers uh, to alleviate the um, negative repercussions of climate change speaking about uh, 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 transforming to climate change this is a very important issue um, also uh, this is, should be through the um, uh, social uh, network protection social protection network this is in the frame of coping with the climate change we we did not decide all these procedures or measures yet uh, also uh, this is going to be decided after achieving those goals in the cop 27 summit we we will um, deal with this issue in a way that clarifies the commitment and will of the participants. The preliminary results which are going to be implemented in Sharm el Sheikh are, are numerous and it will decide or draw a road for the future Also, uh, there are a lot of achievements. This is another, um, uh, another field or another file which we are going to open. Regarding the finance of climate change, and this is a main issue, a main element, we guarantee that all the participant countries are going to participate in this uh, and um, there are negotiations regarding this file and there is a general uh, agreement that uh, finance or money uh, uh, this is going to be one of the main pillars uh, to uh, double the finance these are procedures which is going which should be followed up on the ground even if the final date is going to be 2025 but uh, um, the mechanism of implementing the recommendations on the ground we will host of the world leaders on the 7th and 8th of November and already the invitations uh, were sent to the uh, heads of heads of state and heads of governments also the political determination to accelerate our work to introduce an uh, opportunity to announce uh, these uh, uh, sessions and these policies and these commitments which are going to be declared and announced to the whole world we who we have also all the non-governmental partners should be involved into the issue there is 11 days um, um, are going to be uh, decided to include all of the participants who are going to come whether from governmental or non-governmental organizations also uh, um, energy agriculture uh, youth the uh, future generation also enabling the social societies climate change environment all these meetings are going to be um, shared or attended by Egyptian ministers Egypt opens up to the world President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi meets with world leaders. أعبر لكم عن خالص الشكر والتقدير على حفاوة الاستقبال وكرم الضيافة. Reaffirming Egypt's vision, delivering our voice abroad.
لتطوير التعاون الثنائي الاقتصادي والعسكري الى مستويات غير مسبوقه. Discussing regional and international developments. Solid and strong relations on the path of partnership and development. كلها قد اسهمت في هذه الاجراءات وخصصوا المزيد من الموارد لاجراءات التكيف والتعامل مع تغير المناخ وكذلك الشباب مستمر لكي يكون محرك للتغيير على الارض بالاضافه الى العمل التي تقوم به المؤسسات الماليه نحن كذلك قد اكدنا على العمل على اهميه الطاقه المتجدده وانا لينا قد تحدثت عن ان الظروف الحاليه قد القت الضوء على الامكانيات المتاحه للعمل بشكل اكبر على المناخ وكذلك الاستفادة من الطاقة المتجددة ليس فقط كمصدر للتخفيف من أثار تغير المناخ ولكن تحقيق التنمية المستدامة التي يمكن أن تفيد الدول المتقدمة والدول النامية في نفس الوقت. نحن نؤمن بأن هذا تطور إيجابي وأن Hydrogen and the green technology, all these innovations are going to fulfill all the needs and the demands to face the challenge of climate change, but finance also is necessary to enable all the developing countries particularly to benefit from all these procedures. Also to transfer, or this is the just transfer to a green uh, energy, it's a very important Uh, issue we should realize that to achieve progress in facing uh, and to maintain or to preserve uh, this planet for the coming generations confidence and trust uh, we should trust each other we should have confidence in each other and to shoulder our responsibilities in a fair just way and to realize all that uh, there are challenges we are facing and there are responsibilities we should shoulder also to commit uh, there are uh, joint uh, commitments we are all in the same boat and we should shoulder this responsibility to fulfill our needs together if we want to succeed thank you once again sir the president designate of the cop 27 this is the opening session i'd like to invite the, the Executive Secretary Ibrahim Shiao from the UNFTCC. We are very much happy to have him with us today and we are looking forward to know what are the, uh, the future steps. Um, thank you very much. Uh, um, good morning everyone. Good morning to all ministers. You remember the Niger and uh, one of the most um, uh, countries which are negatively affected by climate change and now uh, or Europe is um, under blazes and fires because of climate change. Uh, uh, COP27 is going to include a lot of uh, points to be discussed any uh, rise in the temperatures of uh, the world. It's a life or death issue, not only in the developing countries, but as we see in the developed countries. With my ca within my capacity, as I am the uh, executive director of uh, climate change and also as uh, the uh, executive secretary of uh, the, the UN uh, Convention of Climate uh, of the, uh, facing or, or facing the desertification. Uh, the damage of um, of lands, uh, also the biological changes and oceans. We uh, we currently see the problem. It's a problem which is facing humanity at large, and we also see that the climate change and its uh, repercussions affects the whole world. We should deal with the clean energy and renewable energy, and so. 
this heat wave and the wildfires it's in an indication how how deep is the climate change now the climate of the world is facing a lot of difficulties uh, also facing uh, the uh, global inflation uh, food security uh, and still the whole world is still facing COVID-19 pandemic ladies and gentlemen currently we are living in a crisis in food crisis and also the price hikes uh, inflation and all this uh, the whole world is still facing pandemic it's still continuing it's still surging ladies and gentlemen maybe these days we are living in a world which uh, suffers a lot of challenges but despite all this we can but science is telling us that the climate change is really increasing and it's uh, one uh, the most important uh, crisis we do have which affects the lives of uh, uh, of millions of people Protecting the plant is our first priority. We are looking forward with international leadership to be able to separate between the short run and long run procedures to take one step and not to cut any tree from any forest. Ladies and gentlemen, my message to you today, the coming months, until the COP27 summit and during the summit itself we should focus on we should focus on focus on preserving our planet and in the Glasgow summit we had this commitment by the world that the developed states are not going to raise the temperature of the world except with half degrees Celsius but we do have a lot of ambitions some progress was achieved on the ground after the Glasgow meeting, but it's not equal to all the um, the big uh, ambitions we have to realize this goal, not to uh, raise the temperature of the world or of the planet uh, or with, um, with the nearly one and a half degrees. But uh, today, the uh, carbon emission is increasing with 14 uh, percent, and this is uh, worries us a lot. There are. There are a lot of nations which are turned back to use uh, uh, fossil fuels and this is not uh, the appropriate time to return back to this. But it's time to benefit from all of the economic uh, opportunities or chances. $23 trillion related to transfer to uh, with a sustainable uh, future to transfer to sustainability but the uh, fossil fuel already ended its mission and we should transfer from uh, this kind of fuel to clean energy now it's time not to return back uh, or Cher Cher is no less important than Paris or Glasgow make no mistake COP27 is one of the most crucial foundation stones of our structure at COP27, leadership means making progress in three key areas, mitigation, adaptation and loss and damage, and thirdly, finance. In finance, the outstanding issue remains the $100 billion pledge. Failure by nations to meet this decade-old commitment is creating a deficit of trust between developed and developing nations in our process. Certainly. The public sector cannot fund all the climate finance the world requires, but governments can set signals, policies, and above all, they must lead by example. Nations should set conditions for the private sector to play a significantly greater role in increasing the new transition, in particular in developing countries and countries in transition. We need to double financing support for adaptation. Looking at mitigation, government need to make progress on a new work program that will drive overall mitigation action. We need similar progress at the first ministerial roundtable on the pre-2030 pre ambition. What we need most of all, however, is 
for all countries to conclude comprehensive national climate action plans for and long-term climate strategies. To say ambition is currently lacking is a severe understatement. Parties in Glasgow were requested to update their NDCs and we must receive these way before COP27. This is particularly true of G20 countries, which account for more than 80% of all emissions. They must lead by example. Adaptation will also be a big focus in Egypt. Especially, specifically, nations must make progress on the global goal for adaptation and focus on implementation efforts that will help finalize their national adaptation plan. We all need to adapt, rich and poor. Obviously, the poorest will bear the brunt. Ladies and gentlemen, in a challenging world, global leaders face a significant agenda at COP27. The good news is that we have made some progress. We are in a new phase, that of implementation. We also have a blueprint and a framework, and we have rules to, to ensure transparency, but it must be backed by, with action. It's time to get on the job. Thank you. Thank you so much, Executive Secretary, um, to underline that it's time to do our job. Uh, that's what we are starting now, and I would like to give the moderation to the special ambassador of Egypt uh, for, the, for the COP. Or the minute. That's fine. We are, I think, opening the floor, aren't we? Yeah. Well, we certainly uh, would like to open the floor uh, for a healthy discussion. And uh, if there's a list, is there a list? So, for the, for the moderation of the NGOs, but we, I can also invite the NGOs please, directly. Please. Yeah. So, because uh, it's not only about politicians, it's uh, about an engagement of civil society, which has pushed us uh, correctly in the last years uh, to do more. And therefore, it's a big pleasure that we can have also the civil society of the Global South with us today uh, with uh, some statements. Uh, first, we hear Melissa Jimenez Gomez Tagle from the Youth Non Governmental Organization. Um, please, uh, Melissa, the floor is yours. <clears throat> the world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who watch them without doing anything. These are the words of Albert Einstein. Ladies and gentlemen, excellences, Distinguished guests, all particles observed. My name is Melissa Jimenez Gomez Tagle, representing Yongo. We, the children and youth constituency of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, come to you today, to this plenary, thanking you for the opportunity to speak, representing the billions of children and young people all over the world, most of them victims of climate change with the majority of us trying to fix the mistakes of the past and current generations for future generations. The Petersberg Dialogue has come a few weeks after concluding the subsidiary bodies 56 in Bonn, which left us with so many disappointments on matter on loss and damage, the global goal on adaptation, so many questions on countries' readiness on the global stock take and lack of ambitious NDCs, which can give hope ensuring we are within 1.5 degrees Celsius. On reducing greenhouse gas emissions, science has been clear for the last 20 years. The planet is warming, and we must work towards phasing out fossil fuels completely as soon as possible. We call upon a whole government and a whole society approach from the business as usual mentality into a sustainable transformational thinking on industry, agriculture, energy, transport, institutions, individuals, and more. We will need to make changes to reduce emissions and adapt to climate consequences that are already happening. 
We also call upon a just transition, ensuring human rights are observed, livelihoods and poorest communities are protected. On access to climate finance, we demand urgent need to the pledge of the $100 billion per year to be paid. Dedicating half of this amount to adaptation would help close significant financing shortfalls for vital measures to protect lives and livelihoods. We wish to reinforce our key ask about governing climate finance matters, which is to scale access and mobilize grant-based adaptation as well as loss and damage finance for vulnerable countries and especially for youth. As the youth constituency, we continue to call for a loss and damage facility, which is critically important. We also support the Climate Action Network that this platform should be used to reach a firm agreement on the inclusion of the loss and damage provisional item on the COP27 agenda. We call upon the inclusion of youth in the global goal on adaptation and urgency on delivering national adaptation plans. With COP27 being hosted in Africa, a region known for its diversity in food, we call upon this dialogue to strengthen capacities for farmers and hydrologists to align food systems and agroecology in the Coronivia discussions. Hope is still here. Decision makers are responsible for keeping it alive. Children and youth have their eyes on the coming conference of the parties in Egypt, where we look forward to seeing more young people, including in the party delegations, as was called for in Article 64 of the Glasgow Climate Pact. We want to be moved by pretty speeches. We demand urgent action, which has not been ambitious for the last 26 years for assisting change based on rights for nature, based on a change of values in humanity, cooperation, trust, peace, and health as priorities over short-term thinking profit and greed. We will be there as we are here today, demanding urgent action and climate justice for all. Nothing about us without us is for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, speaking in the name of the global uh, use, and uh, thank you for underlining that nothing uh, without you is uh, for you. Uh, we clearly heard you, and we clearly heard also your call for, for action. Um, with this, I would like to turn to Augustine Namishi from the Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance. Uh, thanks for being with us. The floor is yours. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a great privilege for us to stand here on behalf of the African Civil Society under the umbrella of the Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance, which in itself is an alliance of more than 1,500 organizations working for climate justice in 45 countries in Africa. We thank the organizers for inviting us, we don't take this for granted because it's never easy to have such an opportunity to talk to the real people. The dialogue is coming at a very critical moment and it's also at a very unique moment. I will explain. Critical in the sense that IPCC report calls for urgent action if we still have to stay in the, within the 1.5 degrees goal in a world that is safe and livable for everyone. It is unique in the sense that it comes in a year where we are celebrating the 30th anniversary of the UNFCCC and again unique in the sense that it is coming at a period when we will be hosting COP27 in a continent that has special needs and circumstances as recognized under Article 4.1e of the UNFCCC. Your Excellencies, we've discussed for 30 years. We've had 26 conference of the parties. While we have been discussing and negotiating, 
The continent, the most vulnerable, has been burning and flooding at the same time. I have in my mind my mother who depends on rain to grow her crops that can no more manage the seasons because she does not know the rains are very unpredictable and she, yet she doesn't know what to feed her grandchildren with. I have in my mind, ladies and gentlemen, this woman from Malawi who has lost all her, house, uh, all her crops, farms, and even children to floods. I have in my mind these school children in DRC who come the next day after rainfall and see that their school has been swept away by floods. I have in my mind, ladies and gentlemen, these African countries that are struggling to adapt to climate change with resources that they don't even have. According to TFON, most African countries will spend more than five times the budget allocated for healthcare on adaptation. This in effect means Africa is continuing to pay for adaptation with the health of its people. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to do something. We have talked over the years. The African woman on the ground knows, feels, doesn't feel the effect of our talking. Can we continue to talk while the people are dying and suffering from the impacts of climate change? Something they do not create? These are the hard questions we have to ask ourselves. Why is COP27 very important and unique for Africans? It is because we have held these 26 sessions, four of which have taken place in Africa, and most of the time we say it's an African COP when it is taking place in Africa. But at the end of the day, the Africans themselves don't feel the pinch of the impacts of the talks that have taken place on their soil. So in this effect, we baptizing the cup in Chamechek, the cup of the African people, where the African people will have a seat at the table and where their needs and aspirations will be met. Do we continue to make promises that we'll never fulfill? Is it fair to promise people that are suffering from the impacts of something they never caused to keep waiting and waiting forever? This is not fair, and this, I think, this year is unique. So we need to take care of that. We are glad, in fact, very glad, but cautiously optimistic about the fact that we are going to be dedicating the COP27 loss and damage, adaptation, finance, and what have you. We think it is not enough to have something on the agenda, but the outcome of what we have on the agenda is what matters. I will leave us with a few questions. We say we are going to double climate finance by 2025. The question we've been asking ourselves is, doubling from what? We have to be clear about that. Because according to CPI analysis, climate finance 2019-2020 was $632 billion. Only $46 billion was dedicated for adaptation and $15 billion for, for drop use. This means if we are doubling $46 billion, excuse our misunderstanding of this, we think during these talks we may be clear about this. The climate finance for adaptation has been so unambitious that if we are talking of only doubling, we have to make more efforts. We think that is fair. Are we going to do this in the spirit of equity and fairness? These are questions we ask ourselves. If you set fire to a man's house, will you give them a loan to rebuild it? Will you sell them the fire extinguisher to put off the fire? This would be injustice if climate finance for adaptation that is coming to African people is coming in forms of loans and a, a, a expensive technology. So this will be injustice, and Martin Luther King said, ladies and gentlemen, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. I thank you for your kind attention. Let's continue to discuss. Thank you very much. Bless you.
thanks uh, a lot for recalling that the climate fight is also a question of uh, justice. We move over now uh, to the national delegations and I would like to call on everybody to put your name tent if you would like to take the floor. We start uh, with Spain followed by South Africa and then Pakistan. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you dear ministers, uh, the coaches from Germany and uh, Egypt for convening us in this um, very important uh, gathering. I left uh, my country under fire, literally under fire. More than 20,000 hectares have been burned this um, last three days. More than 400 casualties uh, are being caused by this uh, heat wave, the second heat wave in less than a month. There are 36 um, active wildfires of first category. There are more than uh, 10 days of uh, day temperature over 40 degrees, night temperature between 25 and 30 degrees. And the surface uh, temperature on Saturday was more than 30 degrees in all over the peninsula, and uh, more than 60 Celsius degrees in a large area in uh, West Spain in a year that has uh, been the worst drought in two decades and with a um, terrible, terrifying prospect still for the days to come. So a very serious concern that uh, shows to what extent as the uh, acting executive secretary of the UNFCCC was saying combines different aspects of what climate change means in the day-to-day -day life. Fighting climate change and greenhouse gases from anthropogenic origin um, are behind these terrible impacts. And I think that tensions, disruptive circumstances, such as those that we have been going through in the last years, cannot be an excuse to delay our action. The COVID pandemics, the Ukrainian invasion, cannot be used to distract our attention on the contrary, they show to what extent we need to work more than ever on a cooperative mood at the global and regional levels, on biodiversity action and protection, on climate action, on ocean protection. Flexibility does not mean giving up our agenda or running in the wrong direction, the other way around. We need to understand that climate mitigation and adaptation are more needed than ever. And we need to avoid a, uh, the biased perception about the general knowledge of people, thinking that short-term needs can be different or can be responded differently from climate action, the other way around. We need to provide consistent response to the short-term needs and the mid- and long-term goals and objectives if we want to succeed. This is why I think that the agenda in Samuel Sake is very important. Of course, it is a cop for the African people, but we all are African people. We are all in the same boat. And I think that we need to be quite consistent in this approach. And we need to remember that adaptation is absolutely key. A response to loss and damage demands is absolutely key. Finance is absolutely key, but mitigation is the first response we need to keep in mind. We need to work in um, the metrics on adaptation to ensure effectiveness in the response, indicators to show to what extent what we do is effective. We need to think in this three years glass globe program so to provide concrete efforts to respond to the loss and damage demands and to be prepared for the worst. We need to work in finance and to shift from millions to trillions, to work on the risk and the risk understanding of uh, wasting or investing money with um, the support of the multilateral banks, the development banks, the transfer from public money. But we need to be sure that the whole money we invest is properly climate proof. And we need to invest much more in mitigation enhanced action that needs to be just, effective, based on renewable energy, on efficiency, 
on a skilling and reskilling of people so to provide a new understanding of what prosperity means. For the time being, we have been able to multiply by two the investments in renewable energy solutions and energy efficiency solutions. But the problem is that we need to multiply at least by three. So there is still a big gap between what we need and what we provide. And in addition to that, we cannot forget our previous commitments, dealing with methane gases, with coal, sorry, methane emissions, coal, coal-related coal emissions, and the need to invest in a proper understanding of what land use can provide and what is the risk of uh, bad use of land to restore biodiversity, to work and preserve the ocean. We in Europe have been working so to provide this fit for 55 answer to ensure that uh, an enhanced ambition proposal is stable by those days. And we in Spain are reviewing in order to update the National Energy and Climate Action Plan, together with the Adaptation Plan, mainly based on water, on land use, on biodiversity restoration, together with the just transition strategies to ensure that people can count on their own prosperity without having the impression that climate action is a threat. The other way around, climate action is a hope. So we will be delighted to work with uh, you all together, but our main claim is that, please, we need to accelerate. There are many people out there asking to accelerate our climate action. And of course, Sharm el Sheikh is about outcomes, not just about promises. Thank you. Thanks a lot, and uh, our thoughts are with uh, your country and your people, as you has described how horrible the situation is currently uh, in, in Spain. I've seen uh, many um, peeping, people liking to have the word. Uh, if I may ask you to look, if you're around five minutes, so everybody can speak who wishes to speak. We have uh, one and a half uh, hours for, the, for this uh, session left. Now the floor goes to South Africa and then followed by Pakistan. Excellencies, a special word of thanks to Chancellor Scholz and the government of Germany for organizing this important dialogue. Congratulations to the Arab Republic of Egypt as the incoming presidency of COP27. We do indeed look forward to the African COP. Excellencies, South Africa is further accelerating its climate actions in the context of just transitions and sustainable development. Since COP26, we have finalized our just transition framework, which will form the basis of our long-term climate action. To this end, we have set up a task team to develop an investment plan for the Just Energy Partnership, or JETP, announced at Glasgow with our partner countries, Germany, France, the United Kingdom, the United States, and the European Union. The Climate Bill, which is currently before our Parliament, lays the regulatory framework for the whole of government, business, organised labour and civil society to implement our country's climate commitments. Today, however, we are very concerned at the lack of progress in the multilateral negotiations at the UNFCCC on key areas since COP26. The discussions on loss and damage, finance, adaptation, and the just transition remain trapped in process-related discussion. Last year in Glasgow, some developing countries were criticized for stressing their national circumstances in relation to some of the desired outcomes of the Glasgow Climate Pact. Yet just over six months after Glasgow, we are witnessing many developed countries reverting back to coal in response to their negative national circumstances. We cannot have backtracking by developed country parties. 
developed countries must continue taking the lead with ambitious action. The ultimate measure of climate leadership is not what countries do in times of comfort and convenience, but what they do in times of challenge and controversy. Climate change is currently costing African countries between 3 and 5 percent of their gross domestic product. Regionally, Africa is experiencing extreme climate impacts, which the continent had very little role in causing. The sixth IPCC report confirms that despite having only 17 percent of the world's population, Africa is only responsible for 3 percent of emissions. The African continent supports ambitious realism, which recognizes our special circumstances and our need to negotiate pathways that meet both the developmental and the environmental needs of present and future generations. The adaptation agenda truly needs a boost at COP27 a boost that will promote its global visibility, balance, and scale up. For Africa, the global goal on adaptation must increase the actual resilience of our population to the adverse impacts of climate change by at least 50% by 2030 and by at least 90% by 2050. Focused must be placed on vulnerable people and communities to support health and well-being, food and water security, infrastructure and the built environment, as well as ecosystems and ecosystem services. It is time that we deal with climate finance with a sense of urgency and on the scale it requires. The reality is that we have failed in promoting adequate ambition on finance. To put things in perspective, according to the UNFCCC Standing Committee on Finance, developing countries need between 5 and 11 trillion US dollars to meet their climate objectives. And yet, according to the OECD, only around 80 billion has been mobilized. This represents less than 2% of the needs of developing countries. The only way in which we can re-establish credibility in financial provision is to set a realistic goal for developed countries to mobilize at least a trillion US dollars per annum to assist developing countries to meet their climate change objectives. COP27 needs to focus on supporting people-centered, just, equitable transitions in the developing world. The urgent need is to adapt now, while we build resilience for the future. We can only avoid loss and minimize damage with the appropriate scale of public finance that does not exacerbate the indebtedness of our continent. I thank you. Thank you very much, and we move on to Pakistan. Thank you very much. Good morning, ministers, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, particularly our friends from civil society. This conference has come at a key moment for all of us. Clearly, it is an inflection point where reassessments have to be made about where we are taking our dialogues and negotiations at the COP27. For Pakistan, ladies and gentlemen, our extreme vulnerability to accelerated climate-induced events has exposed it to a multitude of risks which sometimes look like the perfect storm. These range now from unprecedented heat waves 
raging forest fires, glacial lake outburst floods. We've had about 18 just this spring. Actually, we've had no spring. We've gone directly from winter into summer. A fast approaching water scarcity could be by 2025, as defined by the UN, along with monsoon flooding, which we are undergoing now, torrential rains, at the same time facing growing desertification and droughts another part of the year in other parts of the country, along with rising sea levels. Now, all these changes have made Pakistan the ground zero of climate catastrophe where life on earth, water, and under the water has been impacted at exponential levels. Damage to agricultural productivity, livelihoods, human health, and economic stability have led to what seem very clearly like irreversible impacts, including massive internal displacements, climate-related migrations, and GDP losses, wait for this, that go as high as 9.1% of our GDP. According to the UNSCAP report, we are impacted more than any other country in the world. Now, while mitigation has been foundational to our COP agendas, Pakistan has attempted to meet its articulated ambitions. What we have not seen until today at the multilateral level is a concerted acknowledgement of loss and damage as a core agenda. So we are grateful that it has been put front and center to this conference's uh, core discussions, but we look forward to much more. The Global South is looking now for a robust financial mechanism to actualize its goals on the ground, where a transfer of resources goes beyond pledges and promises. In fact, it is troubling to countries like us that so far, pledges for loss and damage compensation have actually not been made at all. We've been talking about the mitigation ones falling short. Well, the adaptation pledges have not been made. This is either an egregious oversight or worse, an index of the climate injustice that we've all been talking about that is at play in a world where countries like us that emit less than 1% of GHGs are expected to not just fulfill our commitments um, on our own, but also make an unfinanced energy transition or pledge to net zero goals without the means for implementation of such transformational shifts, which are clearly needed. Pakistan also stands with the developing countries. We are chair of the group of 77 plus China at this point, but I'm speaking for Pakistan. And we, but we stand with them in saying that climate-induced loss and damage needs to be redefined to include recurring and amplifying extreme events. Secondly, given that now we agree, notwithstanding the need for mitigation, that adaptation finance now also needs to be front and center, with a serious scaling up of the financial envelope for the same at the COP27 agenda has become non-negotiable. If this does not become a key priority of the next conference of parties meeting, the sense that these agreements are removed from the ground reality that we face will only exacerbate the fault line of inequality between the global south and the north. It will also strip such convenings, such important convenings of crucial consensus needed for fixing a broken planet in the time that is needed. At the same time, Pakistan expresses its deep concern on the inadequacy of the climate finance provided by developed countries to date, as expected under the UNFPCC framework. Pakistan, in fact, goes a step further and urges the global community to make available new and additional and sustained resources for climate finance, especially for adaptation interventions. I'm only echoing what my predecessors have said. <clears throat> We also ask for a need to ensure transparency around climate finance, since most of the developed countries are still double counting finance, climate finance as part of their regular stock take purposes, which needs to be rectified. I hope 
Excellencies, you heard that ask. Lastly, as everybody said, time is a criticality to this entire equation, to this entire equation that we have modeled our global projections on. And this pace of change, of adherence to articulated ambitions, totally misses the mark where the planet remains habitable. Until now, mitigation financing has been prioritized at the global level at the expense of adaptation financing, which has been treated like the stepchild of the multilateral system. This needs to change now. Compelling questions have been already posed uh, and uh, a fair amount of troubling observations made. But what brings hope to this uh, convening, to this important meeting, is the recognition that almost all, including the, our hosts, our kind hosts and co-conveners, have acknowledged the centrality of our core agenda to fixing the planet. Because, ladies and gentlemen, if this does not happen at an accelerated pace, at an accelerated pace, we will see the climate change catastrophe overtake our actions. They're even overtaking our talking points. And history will remember modernity's false promise tragically fail our future and the survival of our planet and our children. So while hope is very important as a motivator, it is not a plan, it is not a program. And I hope, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, that we will come away from not just this conference, but lead up with a sense of urgency on what needs to be done now at the COP27. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Minister Rehman. Now the floor goes to the European uh, Commission. Commissioner Timmermans, please, Franz, the floor is yours. And afterwards, we have Chile and then Singapore. Thank you very much, Annalena. And um, let me say that it is difficult to overstate the importance uh, of our meeting today in the preparation of COP27, since we are collectively under an obligation to translate all the words and the commitments we've made in Glasgow into concrete action to implement what we have uh, promised and uh, announced. Um, on behalf of the European Union, I can tell you that we are strongly committed in doing that. Um, delivery and implementation are the pillars of our climate policies. That's why um, our ministers have already agreed on our Fit for 55 program on a position on that program. The European Parliament has agreed on a position and we've already started the negotiations to hopefully conclude this legislative program before uh, COP27 uh, so that we have something concrete to show for ourselves which will take us, which will take us to reducing our emissions with at least 55% by 2030. Regardless of uh, the uh, very, very negative effects that Putin's war is causing in Europe. And I say uh, to the Minister of South Africa, um, even if because of this uh, war-like situation, uh, some of our member states have to increase um, the use of fossil fuels now, because of our Repower EU plan we've put on the table, this will not take us away from the goals we've set. So even if in the short term this might lead to a, a higher use of coal, uh, or gas, uh, at the end of the day, it will not, uh, it will not uh, take us off our target uh, to reduce our emissions by 55%. Very tough to do, but um, the European Union is strongly committed uh, to do that. Now, obviously, it has been clear for a while that adaptation and loss and damage will be very, very important issues uh, in, uh, the, in Sharm el-Sheikh. Um, but I have to, to reiterate, and I I know I keep saying this at every meeting, but there is no level of adaptation, there is no level of financing of loss and damage that will be able to address the issue if we do not do better on mitigation. It is as simple as that. You know, we're, we're, we're almost reaching a situation where Mother Earth is going to shed humanity as an old skin, rid, rid, its, rid itself of all of us. This is, not about, this is not about saving the planet, it's about saving humanity. And, I think the sense of urgency is heightened by what we see happening in our natural environments everywhere across the planet. 
and quite literally, quite literally, people are dying because of this climate crisis all over the world right now. In Europe, because of the heat right now, you know, Germany and Belgium and the Netherlands just commemorated what happened exactly a year ago, which led to over 220 people dying here as well. Um, firefighters are dying, etc., etc., and it's happening. Just look at what's, what the drought is doing in Africa. So there can be no misunderstanding that there is a need to do more on adaptation. There can be no misunderstanding that we have to use the opportunities that the system we've agreed in Glasgow uh, to um, make sure that uh, a, a loss and damage is addressed in a better way should be implemented. Um, so. Of course, we were also disappointed by the lack of progress in uh, operationalizing the Santiago network um, in Bonn. Uh, uh, we support the operationalization of this, and I think it, is, it can be an important contribution uh, to uh, get essential technical assistance in accessing support for loss and damage to where it is needed, especially the most vulnerable countries, the most vulnerable communities. So, for us, getting the network up and running at COP27 remains a priority. Uh, um, and please, please, don't let the need to discuss finance, and there is a need to discuss it, and we will be part of that discussion, um, uh, lead to this not being done. This also needs to be done. And I think many, many vulnerable uh, countries and communities would be helped if we do uh, better on this. So the challenge we face is enormous. Um, the national circumstances and uh, the different vulnerabilities lead to different responses, but we also know that different countries are facing different risks, and those risks will require different solutions. So we must ensure synergies between relevant international conventions and frameworks, as well as the participation of a wide range of stakeholders and communities of practice. The EU will continue to be uh, the world's biggest donor and support will continue to be scaled up. Uh, all donors should continue being transparent on the delivery of finance, including on how we're taking forward the 10 collective actions identified in the delivery plan, also with the help of Germany and Canada who are preparing the progress report. It is crucial that developed countries increase their contributions and deliver on their commitments. Still, unless global financial flows are aligned with the Paris goals, the shift of the trillions, which is necessary, will not happen. We must continue working on this inside and outside the UNFCCC because aligning financial flows must also be a priority for multilateral development banks and international financial institutions, national policy planning, and the private sector. Now, some are already on this page, and I really want to, to sort of um, uh, shout out to, to uh, Christina uh, at, at, uh, at uh, the IMF, who's the Kristalina at the IMF, who's doing this in an incredible uh, way. But other financial institutions really need to be incentivized uh, to uh, follow this agenda uh, as well. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Uh, and now the floor goes to Chile. Dear Minister, dear colleagues, uh, first of all, thank you very much to Germany and Egypt for organizing this climate dialogue ahead of COP27. COP26 did signal an important turning point towards implementation.